Welcome to part 10 of our series, Secrets of Glessner House. Today, we are going to look at how the house was used in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and discover what is meant by the somewhat mysterious term, human engineering. In the spring of 1938, the Glessner's daughter, Frances Glessner Lee, donated the house to the Armour Institute of Technology, now the Illinois Institute of Technology. The Armour Research Foundation arranged for a new branch of the Human Engineering Laboratory to establish itself in the house. Human engineering refers to aptitude testing that will help individuals to discover their abilities and weaknesses, thus allowing them to find the work that is best suited for them. The laboratory was developed by Johnson O'Connor, born into a prosperous Chicago family in 1891. His father was a successful attorney that at one time shared an office with Clarence Darrow. Johnson received an excellent education, attending the University of Chicago Lab School and Harvard University. O'Connor went to work at General Electric, initially as an engineer. In 1922, after shifting to personnel work, he was asked to develop an in-house program known as the Human Engineering Project that would properly match employees to the various positions within the company. He was surprised to find that employees were hired with less scientific scrutiny than the materials used to make the company's products. His research, testing 3,000 employees, uncovered the fact that aptitudes are innate and that job performance and satisfaction were highest when aptitudes were matched to job tasks. In 1930, O'Connor opened his Human Engineering Laboratory at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. Over the next several years, he continued to analyze specific aptitudes and how they could enhance or detract from performance in a variety of careers. In May 1938, O'Connor expanded his work to Chicago, opening his laboratory in Glessner House. He preferred a residential building for his work noting that people who had experienced trouble in school were prejudiced against the classroom. So he preferred testing in a setting that felt more like a living room. Later that year, he wrote to Francis Glessner Lee, noting that the laboratory was doing well in its new Chicago facility and that everyone was enjoying their work in the historic building. The library was used as the reception room the Glessner's former bedroom was used as a consultation room, and testing took place in the parlor and dining room. O'Connor took a small office on the second floor in the former female servant's wing. He reported that the building was being maintained in perfect condition, but was specific to note that the vines had completely grown over the tympanum above the front door. He asked Francis Glessner Lee if he could trim the vines to reveal the architectural detailing underneath. He also noted that the chrysanthemums were in full bloom in the courtyard and that, overall, the house provided the perfect setting in which to conduct his testing. He reported that as soon as the laboratory opened, architects started dropping in to see the house, and architectural classes were making formal visits between five and ten tours a week were being given. O'Connor noted that he was anxious to gather photographs of Richardson's other work to have on display, and that he had started acquiring architecture books to have available for those who were considering and were best suited for that field of work. In this article, he strongly noted that women were perfectly suited to become architects. In his book, The Too Many Aptitude Woman, he listed several universities where women accounted for a significant portion of the students enrolled in architectural studies. The title of the book came from O'Connor's belief that if a person possessed more than four or five aptitudes, it could lead to frustration and unhappiness, as it would be difficult, if not impossible, to fully develop them all. His particular interest in architecture undoubtedly came from his wife, Eleanor Manning O'Connor. In 1906, she was the first woman to graduate from the architecture program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. A few years later, 
she formed one of the first architectural partnerships in the United States, headed by female architects. She worked closely with her husband at the laboratory, encouraging women to pursue careers in engineering, architecture, and the sciences. By the time the laboratory opened in Glessner House, the operation was testing nearly 4,000 people per year. This report, issued the year after the Chicago facility opened, noted the gift of the house by Francis Glessner Lee and specifically referred to it as a, quote, distinguished dwelling designed by H. H. Richardson, unquote. The symbol of the laboratory, seen on the left, is a square peg in a square hole, based on O'Connor's oft-asked question, do you feel like a square peg in a round hole? O'Connor's work was published widely, including this 1941 article in Atlantic Monthly. The White Collar Girl column in the Chicago Tribune frequently wrote about O'Connor and the laboratory. In this article, she recorded the 10 attributes that had been identified by that time. They included finger dexterity, accounting aptitude, structural visualization, tweezer dexterity, inductive reasoning, creative imagination, visual memory, observation, tonal memory, and personality, or whether the person worked better alone or in a group. O'Connor also noted that in several of these areas, women consistently scored higher than men, including inductive reasoning, which he noted was normally referred to as women's intuition. Here we see the device used to test for tweezer dexterity, an original model at top and a modern version below, which is now called the O'Connor Tweezer Dexterity Test. Men tended to score higher on this test, although women scored higher with finger dexterity. By the early 1940s, O'Connor's laboratories had tested over 75,000 individuals, the results reinforcing and expanding upon the basic concepts he developed 20 years earlier. He was an eagerly sought-after speaker and was frequently consulted by personnel managers at companies of all sizes. He also published a dozen books, the most significant being The English Vocabulary Builder. He found, time and time again, that proficiency with vocabulary was essential to success, and since this could be learned, he strongly encouraged its active study. WordSmart's vocabulary acquisition software is based on O'Connor's model. The title of his book, Ideaphoria, referred to a person's aptitude for creative thought or imagination. By early 1945, the laboratory had moved out of Glessner House and found itself settled into the former mansion of Cyrus McCormick on Rush Street. By coincidence, this house had a close tie to Glessner House, as McCormick's company had merged with Glessner's and others to form International Harvester in 1902. The McCormick Mansion was raised in 1952, and the laboratory was removed to a more modest dwelling at 161 East Erie Street. It continues to occupy a suite in that building to this day. Johnson O'Connor died in July 1973 while studying the Zapotec Indians in Mexico. His wife died later that month. Since 1922, hundreds of thousands of people have discovered their natural abilities utilizing O'Connor's methods, and have used the information to make career and educational decisions. The Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation has 11 offices across the United States with its research department in Chicago. This concludes our look at the Human Engineering Laboratory. We hope you have enjoyed learning more about our latest secret of Glessner House. Tune in next time when another secret will be revealed.